Hi everyone, great to be back. And before we get into the car, I need to make a bit of a correction because I was called out quite rightly by a viewer last time when discussing the Olympus engine, which is the one that goes in the Vulcan and Concorde. I said it had three shafts through the middle of it. Well, it doesn't, it's got two. And what's even more annoying is I knew that. So why I said it, I've no clue. I don't read a script, I just talk at you. So we know this little Orpheus engine quite well. And this is a single spool engine. It has a compressor in here with seven little stages of blades, and it has a turbine back here with one set of blades. And they're all on one shaft. So however fast that shaft goes, everything on it goes at the same speed. But this wouldn't fly your Vulcan. This wouldn't get you to Moscow with a bucket of sunshine in its belly. It would be lucky if it would taxi around the airfield. So how do you make this thing bigger? Because it is, at the end of the day, a compromise. It's like the engine in your car. It's not all things to all men. It's not brilliant at low speed and brilliant at high speed and brilliant in the middle. It's the best of a bad job. And this is quite well optimized. The blades at the front aren't, are going a bit slower than you want them. And the ones at the back are going a bit faster than you want them. And the ones in the middle are in the Goldilocks zone and are quite happy. But you can't just build it bigger. Because if you do that, you've got big heavy blades, big long blades. They're going to stretch at the kind of speeds this rotates at. They're going to try and scrape around the outside of the case. They're going to try and tear themselves out by the roots. The tips are going to go supersonic. The airflow is going to be compromised in all sorts of ways. So you can't just make it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So in a perfect world, what you would do is you would make another one of these, but a bigger one, and run it at a nice gentle speed to get air into the front of the second compressor, which is going faster, and optimize them both. And then to drive your nice big compressor at the front, you put a nice big turbine at the back, and you run that at its optimum speed, and you run this at its optimum speed. And that would give you a much bigger engine, much bigger fire, a lot more gas, because at the end of the day, that's all it is, it's a big gas generating plant with a propelling nozzle, that's what it does, and all this machinery just makes gas. So that would let you do it, but how do you have another compressor out the front with big blades turning slowly, relatively slowly, and another turbine at the back to drive it and optimize the speed of those two bits while this bit in the middle is still optimized. And it's really simple on paper because what you do is you make sure this one, this spool, has a hollow main shaft. And then you put another shaft up the middle of it and under one end you put your new compressor and on the other end you put your new turbine and you allow that spool to run slower than the one in the middle but it's at its happy speed and the one in the middle is at its happy speed and that way you can get much better airflow through the engine a much bigger engine and now you can get your Vulcan to take off and that's a twin spool engine that's how it works in a nutshell but if you look at the RB211, which is the engine that was developed for the Lockheed TriStar that made Rolls-Royce go bust in the 70s, that's a three-spool engine. So that's got a, another compressor on the front, then his little whizzy Orpheus bit, and then another turbine, and a third shaft, and that has a, one of those huge blowy fans on the front, and another turbine at the back to run that. That's a three-spool engine. And it lives on to this day as the Trent series of engines, which are brilliant, world-beating engines, well, at least up there, and they still live on. So that's a three-spool engine, the Olympus is a two-spool engine, so hopefully I've corrected that. So, back to the car, because there's another problem on it that was baked in from the day it was built that is really annoying. Don't know how they've done it, but have a look at this. Herein lies the problem, and this problem's been here forever. You can see that that has been cut away, so that that there should sit down here, which would make that surface flush with that surface. But it's not, it's a good quarter of an inch higher. And it's the same at that side, that's been cut away to fit against the underside of there. And it's the same, and then you've got a gap here, you can put a pencil in. Now I thought this was crash damage and I put a clamp on there but if you've got crash damage it's used all its elasticity and then it's stretched 
But if you push it, it uses its elasticity to help you. And as soon as I pushed that, I thought, no, no, this, this isn't crash damage. This isn't going to move. So I had a look on the inside. And it's a bit difficult to photograph. But you can see in there, there's the same gap with a quarter of an inch of glue. And I thought, that's not right. It's not crash damage. It's always been like that. So I went round to the other side and had a look there. And that's exactly the same. This side is understood. The other side I've taken the end cap off the cross member. This side hasn't been touched yet. And you can see quite clearly that that edge is well below that height. And in here, you've got a quarter inch of glue. And it's obvious that that has never been the same height as that. This has always been a quarter of an inch below it. It all being the wrong way up. And it's been like that from birth. The thing's been hanging on these lumps of glue, which of course have failed. So when they've put the panel on the top, it's been a quarter of an inch high there, and it's fitted at this end, and it's sloped down and left gaps. I'll show you what I mean. The result of this near half inch discrepancy there is that this panel which extends all the way to the back doesn't actually touch the top of this panel. There's a gap under there of about 4mm. We decided the best answer to this was to make a new panel but to make it a nice close fit. Because they just put big slabs of glue in. The glue's alright as a thin film, it'll move with the substrate, but if you put a quarter of an inch lump of glue in, it's just a big lump of hard plastic, and as soon as the thing moves, it's just been smashing the glue and it falls out. So we thought we'll make a close fitting panel to fit in here, and then we'll route this bit out, so we can then bond the honeycomb directly to the steel, and get the level correct, which means we can then glue it in along its whole length, instead of a little bit here with two rivets, and a little bit at that end with nothing, and nothing all the way up the middle. So we can do a much better job of that. It's a bit rubbish. In fact, it's a lot rubbish. It doesn't fit. The cutouts are too big. So you're not gonna get any glue in there. Well, you will, but it'll be an half an inch thick. It really is a bit of a terrible fit. So I think we're gonna have to, oh, and by the way, it's full of rally cross circuit. So we'll get on and, and redesign that, I think. Right, first things first, I'm going to get the rest of the honeycomb off this thing. It hasn't been attached by very much, that's for sure. Next, I am going to get the vacuum cleaner on it. That's a bit bad. I see what I'm working now. Time to cut some honeycomb. So, what are you doing, Bill? Just setting up to cut a slice of honeycomb off this. But I don't want to waste any, so I'm setting it up to the nth degree. I was imagining if I cut a big strip off the bottom of here and it was a millimetre too narrow. That would be really annoying. Did you go to stop? No, I'd, I'd be more likely to cry. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I wouldn't go in a straw. I've got children for that. Ta da! <laughs> and you know the most annoying thing is that you used to be able to get pencils in the shops. Mm -hmm. shops and you used to be able to get them at um, screw fix. So you could go to buy this one. That's a screw fix one. You could go and buy a little toilet roll holder at screw fix and put 600 pencils in your pocket. <laughs> Have you turned the microphone on, Debs? Aye, uh, microphone's on. Yay! Cause you know, well, I've got your head exactly. in shot this time. It's what? I've got your head in shot. Hey, that makes a change. <laughs> We're rubbish YouTubers, tell me. <laughs>
<laughs> That's what happens when you let middle-aged people loose on YouTube. <laughs> if you turn the microphone on. <laughs> <laughs> if we if we were young teeny vloggists or something, it'd all be done. There'd be somebody flitting around with a lighting ring and somebody editing on their phone as we speak. And he has us lot. Go to me, kind of work a square. <laughs> Why I can work a square <laughs> <than> you? <laughs> well, I'm, I'll give it to you because I thought you might do better than me. So. Is it in the room? <laughs> <laughs> and here is the result of all that messy mayhem which I've just spent half an hour cleaning up. It has very close fitting cutouts, both ends, shaped around the Concord corner, and it has 5mm routed out of that end to make sure that it sits down flat onto the top of the, well, the bottom of the chassis, and it gets rid of that sloping problem, which means we now don't have big thick lumps of glue in there, which just don't perform. So that fits a treat. Well, that all fits brilliantly well. We'll get Gordon, the expert router, to do the other side when he's in through the week. Well, we'll ask him nicely. And I said we'd get a rivets, and we've got a rivets. And I've popped a few on here, popped a few, because that's the point I want to make. Before I was cleaning the bench, and I said I was going to get the vacuum cleaner. Now, it's a Henry made by Newmark. I think, does Newmark make Henry's? Yes, they do. Not a Dyson, not a Hoover, a vacuum cleaner. In the same way that that isn't a pop rivet, and that isn't a pop rivet, and that is a pop rivet. That's an Avdel monobolt, which is made by Avdel. That's a Cherry Max rivet, made by Cherry. And that's a pop rivet, made by Pop. Because Pop isn't a type of rivet, it's a manufacturer of rivets like Dyson and Newmark and Hoover make vacuum cleaners. The type of rivet is a blind rivet. And that's a rivet where you can't get on the back to set it. We did something like 17 and a half thousand rivets in the Bluebird, most of which were snap rivets. And with those, you have a rivet hammer on one side, you have a block on the back, you cut it to the right length and you just brrr, and you buzz the two together and that grips the metal. But if you can't get round the back, which you obviously can't with a honeycomb core because your rivet's just going through one of the skins, you need a rivet that you can pull from the outside with a rivet puller. So you need a blind rivet. And that's what these are. So I'll show you one or two of the, the types of rivets that we're going to use on this build and the rationale behind choosing them and how they work. A little bit of rivet science, it might be useful if you're building a car because it's a perfectly viable method of fixing stuff. It's just better when it's done the way the aeroplane people like you to do it. So here goes. These are two of the rivets that we're going to use quite a lot on this build. That is an eighth of an inch, 3.2 mil, countersunk, and it's a closed stem rivet. It's capped at the bottom. So if you're working anywhere where there might be water ingress or anything else, a closed stem rivet is always a better bet because there's nothing you can get in there to set up corrosion. And that's countersunk, so we'll use those on the inside of the cabin so there's no sticky or bubbly bits anywhere. And the grip length, which is the distance from under the head to the end of the rivet, that has to be chosen carefully. That's the thickness of materials you're joining plus one and a half diameters. So this probably isn't the right grip length, but it is the right type of rivet. So we'll select the right grip length and get those ordered. Another rivet we're probably going to use quite a lot of is this. It's often on the same. It's an eighth. It's closed stem, but it's not countersunk and it's also stainless. And that one is made by Pop. So it's a genuine Pop rivet. How cool is that? This is the new attachment for the floor. Floor goes that way. And it's inch and a half 
by an inch and a half. So it goes into the side of the sill, get a good fix there, strengthen the bottom edge of the sill, which is a little bit ratty, but we're fixing it. And also get a good hold on the floor. The original one, that one, was three quarters by three quarters with an inch, no, with a rivet every two inches and then some glue. And between the rivets, it was, the glue was on its own. So this is a very much more substantial fixing and it has a lot more holes in it. And there's a good reason for the extra holes. So these holes will eventually be an eighth of an inch diameter. And a rivet only has a certain amount of influence. So it's about a half an inch, it's four times the diameter. So you can imagine if you just put one rivet every two inches, you've got a big section in the middle that's not doing anything. But the influence, the area of influence on an eighth rivet is four times the diameter. That's the rule of thumb, 4D. So four times an eighth of an inch is a half an inch. So there's a half inch circle in which that rivet is actually clamping. And because of the way the pitch of rivets is staggered, by the time you put a half inch circle around all of them, they all ever so slightly overlap. So you end up with the whole surface clamped, which you don't get when you put a rivet every two inches. Now the glue has a chance. Now the materials will move together and the glue won't be exposed and smash itself to pieces. So that's how the floor is going in. So I hope you found that interesting. I always hope you find it interesting. It gives me a chance to be all anoraki and anal and, and talk details. Maybe there's some stuff there you can use on a project of your own. I hope so. And as ever, great to talk. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe. And we'll do another one. Plenty more to come. See you soon. <laughs>